Internet and machine learning. Uh, the work I'm going to describe was done uh, in collaboration with Andrew and Anne at the University of Texas, and we are at MIT. So I thought I would uh, start off by explaining uh, what I mean by this term deep learning, which is maybe not a term that everybody here is familiar with, although uh, perhaps that's been changing a bit in the last few years, I'm not sure. So when people talk about deep learning, uh, they usually mean uh, a type of machine learning model called a neural network. So this is a pretty uh, cool term. Uh, it sort of sounds like we've maybe reverse engineered the human brain, um, which is not exactly true, although that's, um, that's where the term does come from. Uh, these, these neural network models actually began uh, in the 1940s as an attempt to uh, model the, the neurons and the connection between them and the human brain. Um, although today we, we use them for um, usually far more mundane tasks and then more of an engineering entity than a, a biological one. Um, but I learned, I actually learned a really cool fact about neural networks yesterday. Um, so the, the first neural network that was trained as a machine learning model was called the Perceptron. Um, and it was trained uh, by Frank uh, Rosenblatt in 1958. And this I learned that this was the same Frank Rosenblatt who actually proposed the transit method for identifying exoplanets. <laughs> Um, so I think it's actually really fitting that uh, what I work on is uh, neural networks for identifying transits. I think that's pretty amazing. Okay, so um, I won't go too deep into what neural networks are and how they work, but I just want to give one concrete example um, of neural networks and um, you know what, what they're capable of. So the canonical example is image classification. This is where they sort of really first off the scene about five years ago. Um, and so today's uh, you know, state-of-the-art neural networks um, are more capable of um, discerning between uh, Alaskan Malamutes and Siberian Huskies, um, which, you know, looking at these two photos, I don't know if I personally would be able to tell the difference here, um, especially when you've got these dogs in different poses in different lighting conditions in different contexts and um, in some cases with like uh, different parts of the image obscured um, and so, so this neural network here that can identify between these two dogs is actually trained on uh, all sorts of things it can identify different types of foods and vehicles and carpentry tools and everything um, so, so these, uh, these neural networks are actually very, um, very general and very powerful uh, so, so let's obviously bring it back a little bit. Um, so as we heard yesterday, Kepler's mission was to search for uh, Earth-sized planets orbiting in the habitable zone of stars like our sun. And we saw this diagram uh, several times yesterday. Uh, obviously, a lot of the talks were talking about the sort of gap in the upper left. Um, but I'm interested also in the, the gap in the lower right. So um, if you were to plot Earth on, on this, obviously Earth is sort of uh, lonely right there at the bottom right, and um, part of my work, uh, I'm interested in seeing if we can sort of find out some, some more friends on it. Um, so, uh, one, one thing that's very relevant here is that um, the Kepler mission and the Kepler pipeline uh, has, has low completeness in the Earth analog regime. So, here I'm showing a plot of uh, completeness or a fraction of planets detected. Um, Using using uh, injection recovery tests versus the signal to noise or MES, um, the the completeness of a, a perfect pipeline is the uh, red line here, and the actual completeness that we get are these um, blue bars here. Um, and so perhaps there are um, Earth-like planets sort of hiding here in this uh, in this region. Um, where the blue lines are actually quite a fair, a fair way below the red line. And perhaps we can uh, still go in and, and recover those earths. So, um, yeah, there may be undiscovered earth analogs in the capital of Earth. Cool, so um, as uh, I'm sure most people here are aware, uh, there's, there's two ingredients that we need if we want to go in and find planets. One is a detection pipeline. Uh, and the second is uh, a way to vet the signals that we detect. 
So uh, I'm going to start off by talking uh, quickly about the detection pipeline. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it in too much detail. Basically, we use box link squares. Uh, many people who do transit searches here are going to be aware of this pipeline or this algorithm. Um, but we're, we're going to, to tune our pipeline and tweak it in order to maximize the recovery of planets around sunlight stars. So uh, as we're developing and evaluating our pipeline, um, we actually used uh, a set of 50,000 sun-like stars uh, shown on this plot in red here, um, and we used the, um, the uh, light curves with injected planets that were released by Jesse Christensen. Um, and our goal when, when tweaking and evaluating our pipeline is to see um, if we can simply maximize the number of these injected planets recovered uh, as, our, as our number one goal here. And so, uh, indeed, we can. So, um, on, on that set of injected planets, um, we can uh, recover more of those um, than the Kepler pipeline. Uh, specifically, uh, in this sort of low signal to noise regime, um, we can, we sort of have a very high recovery rate, but compared to um, the Kepler pipeline, we are actually able to recover. Um, especially down at the bottom here, uh, maybe as many as twice, twice as many of these low signal to noise um, injected transits. So of course, the, uh, what everyone's probably thinking is that in order to recover these low signal to noise um, injected transits, we need to um, uh, our, our output signals are low signal to noise, and at low signal to noise, there are there is a huge number of um, you know false positive detections, especially at long periods. So uh, instead of having these nice high signal to noise detections that were sort of spat out by the Kepler pipeline during the mission and, and vetted by humans, um, the, the pipeline that we've developed um, actually spits out a ton of junk, basically. So, because there's so many, so much of this junk that's out there, we need a, an automated uh, and accurate way to actually sift through all these uh, detections. And so, uh, this is where um, our, our deep learning vetting pipeline comes in. Um, so, here's a, a simple animation of uh, how a neural network sort of works. Um, I won't go into too much detail here, uh, but essentially, a neural network is comprised of a, a sequence of layers. Each layer is a very simple parametric function, but when you stack them all together, you actually get something that is capable of uh, performing very, very complex uh, functions, very, very complex mappings from the input to the output. So in this case, um, we can train a neural network to input um, literally just pixels and uh, you know, pass those pixels through all these layers and in the end sort of transform that into a classification of what's in the image. And uh, our technique is to take um, essentially the, the same kind of neural network and uh, pass in some sort of representation of a possible transiting planet candidate and output whether um, that candidate is a, a planet or a false positive. Um, so we, we uh, constructed this neural network, here's a little schematic of it, um, we call it, call it, call it Astronet. Um, the inputs to our network, um, it's actually a, a single TCE, or um, transiting planet candidate. We actually feed in two different uh, representations of it. Um, both of those representations are phase folded um, with the effective event centered. Um, on, on the left, we feed in what's called a, a global view. We feed in the entire period um, to enable the, to allow the neural network to sort of see if there's any other, anything else going on in the light curve, if there's sort of periodic variation outside of the um, port of transit or if there's, say, a secondary eclipse or something. Um, and we also uh, found that it made our neural network more accurate if we uh, zoom in on the transit event and feed that in uh, separately so that the, the model gets a really good up-close um, view of the actual shape of the transit. So when we tried and evaluated our model on signals from the Kepler main mission, we found that uh, it was 96% accurate, which is great. Um, and so we, we took this and we did a, a trial run uh, on Kepler's multi-planet systems, looking for new planets 
uh, that were potentially missed. Um, so this is obviously a small scale um, uh, sort of test run. We did manage to find two new planets that were missed by previous searches of the data. Neither of these are Earths, obviously, that uh, both have periods of about 14 days. Um, but we, we definitely consider this a proof of concept uh, in two ways. One, that it is possible to go in and find um, planets that, were, that, that have been missed um, by the chemical mission so far. And two, that our neural network is able to um, uh, identify those. So uh, Kepler 99i was the eighth planet discovered in Kepler 90, which is cool. Um, we also have applied the same technique very recently to K2. Um, it was a schematic neural network. It's, it's almost identical. We actually added in a few other features that helped, including the depth and the impact um, parameter of the detected signal. And again, we, we ran this um, in a trial run. We have a, a proof of concept, and we actually have discovered uh, two new planets in K2 as well, this paper was um, just recently accepted, so it should be out soon. Um, and finally, um, we have uh, been using Astronet for tests. This is run at MIT. So Astronet is currently uh, performing the triage step in the quick reply line uh, at MIT for tests. So obviously, we've we've been using this uh, this technique in, in sort of a proof of concept way. Um, but what we really want to do is push down to the Earth analogs. Um, and so we want to search the full Kepler sample rather than the smaller sets that we've been searching so far. Uh, one thing we need to do is improve the performance of our model on long period false positives. These are particularly challenging for the model, in part because we don't actually have that many long period false positives in our training set. And two, because long period false positives, as we've seen in, in certain papers, can, can mimic uh, transiting signals, uh, transiting planets really closely. Um, and then, uh, at the sort of a, a next step from there, if we can uh, evaluate the models, the full system's performance, and understand <coughs> its biases, we can potentially use the system to uh, measure Earth analog transfers.